Welcome to another virtual Live Talks Los Angeles event. We welcome Scott Turow to our screen to talk about the writing life and his new book, The Last Trial. Scott is a writer of several best-selling works of fiction, including Testimony, Identical, Innocent, Presumed Innocent, The Burden of Truth, and two works of nonfiction. He's a frequent contributor of essays and uh, op-ed pieces to publications such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, and The Atlantic. Interviewing him is Ridley Pearson, also a best-selling author of more than 50 award-winning suspense and young adult adventure novels. His novels have been published in two dozen languages and have been adapted for network television and the Broadway stage. Ridley's middle grade reader series include The Kingdom Keepers, Steel Trap, and Lock and Keep. He's also the co-author with Dave Barry of the Peter and the Starcatchers series. Ridley and Scott are also members of the all-author rock band, The Rock Bottom Remainders. Again, Scott's new book is The Last Trial and is available wherever books are sold. Welcome, Scott and Ridley. Thanks, thanks, Ted. Thank you. Thanks, Rid. I, I noticed, though, Ted, that you did not include <clears throat> in Ridley's m many accolades and achievements the, my line that he is the man who put the id in Idaho. So... <laughs> <laughs> Never heard that one, Scott. <laughs> so full disclosure, um, as Scott already knows this, but I, uh, my whole life I've been a, a huge fan of his. Um, and we've been friends for now 20 years or something, but uh, I, I've just always adored your work. So I'm, I'm coming at this a little bit prejudiced. And I just want anybody watching this to know that. And I thought before we dove into Scott the writer, um, if you could tell us about your early years, sort of Scott the early student and post-grad, and uh, especially, you know, the, the part that's warm to my heart, which was your years with Wallace Stegman. Yeah. Um, well, um, Ridley and I both have in common uh, the fact that we were <clears throat> far from overnight successes. And, uh, you know, we, we ended up uh, on different paths, uh, but you can take from both of our uh, early careers uh, the simple lesson that if at first you don't succeed, uh, you know, try it again. So uh, by the time I wrote Presumed Innocent, I had written at least four unpublished novels. And that began while I was in college. And uh, I was kind of you know, desperate as a college student to figure out how did somebody become a novelist? And uh, the answer, frankly, is to sit down and write a novel. But uh, as obvious as that is to me now, it wasn't that clear to the 19 and 20 year old. And uh, there were every, uh, every year in the English department at Amherst College in Massachusetts, where I was an undergraduate, there were these red banded announcements that said that the uh, creative writing fellowships at Stanford were going to be awarded that year. And uh, a lot of the writers that I just had huge admiration for, whether we're talking about Tilly Olson or Robert Stone or Larry McMurtry or Ernest Gaines, just, just a lot of the people whose work uh, I was hugely fond of, uh, I had you know, discovered in studying their biographies, they'd all been writing fellows at Stanford. So I thought, well, that's the ticket. That's the ticket. Try to get one of those Stanford writing fellowships and it's, you know, somebody will wave a magic wand and, you know, then you'll become like those people are a major American writer. Uh, and lo and behold, uh, I actually became a writing fellow at Stanford. And those were, you know, good years and bad uh, for me. Uh, good because I was surrounded by a lot of um, incredibly talented young writers who had the courage to look people in the eye and say, you know, I'm going to be a novelist or a poet. Uh, and uh, that, that was good. Um, but uh, what was bad, as I like to say, is although they did not all write like Ernest Hemingway, they drank like Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> and uh, certainly Ray Carver, who was in many ways the leader of the band during many of my 
years at, at Stanford was Ray was still in his hard drinking days. I don't know if people who admire his work realize that the best of it was done when Ray stopped drinking. Um, so, you know, and it was, so it was kind of a challenging environment in other ways. Uh, but Wally Stegner, uh, you know, he of blessed memory, certainly in this house, yeah. was uh, very kind to me, um, was a really good teacher. Um, he wanted people to take uh, the university and the opportunity that they were being given seriously. And uh, there was at least one of the writing fellows uh, who just drove Wally crazy um, because, you know, he was so smug uh, and entitled. He frankly had been an undergraduate at, at Harvard uh, and he just thought it was all going to come to him. And, uh, you know, and, and for, for Wally, um, writing was first and foremost a job. Uh, and that was one of the most valuable things that he taught me and many of the other people. And there were a lot of great writers around then uh, and people whose names some of the folks who were listening would know, like Alice Hoffman or Richard Price and um, uh, others who are, were wonderful writers, the, the late Chuck Kinder, for example. Um, and so, uh, but you know, we were all listening hard in most cases. And one of the things that Wally said was, uh, you have to put your rear end in the chair every day uh, because uh, while the muse may not always visit, you at least have to give her a chance to show up. And, <laughs> uh, you know, and those, that was great advice. Wally said that he wrote um, two pages every day of the year except Christmas. And he looked at us and he said, why do I do that? Because in 700 pages, there has got to be something worth saving. Uh, and, uh, and that was just a great um, example of the kind of discipline he had as a writer and that he commended to his students. That sounds very much like Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Yeah. Who, who spent his mornings editing, as I understand, and then tried to write one good page a day and he said, at the end of the year, I've got a 360 page novel. What's, what's not to love? Yeah. So, um, yeah. but it's, it's hard to convince, especially younger people, that life in the creative arts, uh, for all of its, you know, bohemian uh, glamour, it's, it's a job. At the end of the day, it's a job. And, uh, you know, Rid, you've known many uh, more great musicians than I have. But even in the few that uh, I've been privileged to hang around with in, in your company and the, that of our other bandmates, but for the, even, even for them, you know, even for people like Roger McGuinn or Warren Zevon, right. it's a job, man. Job. It's a job. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I try to convince, when I talk to my students, I try to convince them that, you know, writing is not sitting under a lilac bush with a cigar and a bottle of scotch you actually have to sit down at eight in the morning and stop at five in the afternoon to get anywhere you know i was so lucky in my career to have mentors um, as well as good teachers did you other than wally did you have uh, i call him wally <laughs> only because you do scott i've yeah. always called him wallace but um do you did you have any mentors along your professional path well i had um i was really lucky while I was an undergraduate that the world was falling apart. So um, it, it seemed like a good idea, given how often classes were closed for demonstrations, to just take, <laughs> uh, give, give students um, a period of complete independence. And uh, I was um, lucky enough as a senior to just spend my time writing. And my teacher and uh, Subsequently, my longtime friend and mentor uh, was Tilly Olson, who's just a oh. great, great American uh, writer of uh, yeah. shorter fiction. Um, and, uh, you know, a remarkable, um, sometimes eccentric uh, personality. Uh, it was a, an interesting biography of Tilly that um, 
revealed that, you know, a, a lot of what Tilly claimed about herself wasn't exactly true, which is true of a lot of writers as it happens. Um, and, you know, as somebody who was her friend and her student, I learned that slowly, um, you know, that she, like everybody else, had at least one clay foot. Uh, but she was wonderful to me. Uh, and she was wonderful uh, for all kinds of reasons. Most of all, that she had faith in me as a writer. Uh, and of course, you know, you're, you're young, that's what you need. Somebody to say, you can really do this. If you work hard, um, you, you, can, you can do it. Uh, and um, so, you know, she was a major influence. Uh, the other two, quote unquote, tutors I had at that time were uh, the great Americanist uh, professor named Leo Marx, who was a um, you know, major American studies scholar. And then a uh, poet and English professor, a guy named David Sofield, who, um, you know, every now and then in the years that followed my leaving college, I would pick up the New Yorker, find you know, one of David's poems there. So he was a, he was a serious writer in his own right, uh, which was very helpful, um, you know. Yeah. So, uh, so yes, I had, I had mentors um, and, uh, you know, and then, you know, then there's what you learn from the major people in your life, like my grandfather, who, you know, was mm. just, you know, stoical and a um, little bit cynical and, uh, always challenged me in my <clears throat> ambition to be a writer, saying to me, Scott, says, what kind of life is this? Locked up all day in a room with a pencil. Um, and uh, <laughs> I, knew he meant, I, I knew he meant the best for me, so. Try that leads us perfectly into, uh, you have this bizarre career of not only um, studying under Wallace Stegner, but then I believe you taught at Stanford in your postgrad. I did, yeah. and and then walk us just quickly through. You become a lawyer, and then you become a writer again. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> what's that boomerang about? Well, the the you know I kind of blundered along uh, in this ambition to be a writer. I kind of doubt that. And uh, no, it was believe me. Um, and as a supplement to the writing fellowships, there were um, these little lectureships at Stanford, uh, which some of the writing fellows got. It, it, I don't, it wasn't talent-based. It had to do with, you know, whether or not you were verbal enough to be able to teach. Um, and uh, so I ended up as one of, the, one of these Jones lecturers and taught for three years in the English Department of Creative Writing Center at Stanford. Well, since it's Stanford, that paves the way for an academic career. And, and it did for many of those people who, like I mentioned, my friend Chuck Kinder. Chuck was a, uh, Chuck was a Stegner uh, fellow. And then, you know, he ultimately spent many years, um, including some, I believe, as the director of the creative writing program at the University of Pittsburgh. Hmm. So, and, and Chuck had a truly academic side, even though he didn't like to acknowledge it publicly. Um, <laughs> I, I found that I didn't, uh, and, um, you know, what was going on in the English department, uh, was great and interesting to me while I had been a student, but I did not want to steep myself in English criticism, the political battles that, uh, and frankly have consumed English departments in the years since had begun starting then. Uh, and I could see that even though um, it was proving easy for me to get another academic job somewhere else, uh, that that wasn't the way I wanted my life to go. So what did I want to do? Uh, and this is when, you know, I, I really came to the law as an adult. Uh, I had no idea what the law was or what people who practiced law did until my college roommate started to graduate from law school. 
Uh, and then the friends that I made in the Bay Area who weren't writers were all lawyers. Uh, and mm -hmm. particularly the people who were practicing criminal law, uh, whether they were prosecutors or defense lawyers, I, I thought it was just amazingly interesting. Just really just pulled at my heart and my viscera. Uh, and so I began to ask myself what seemed like a, um, you know, it's almost like everybody who's, who's ever been young asks themselves, you know, well, am I, am I really heterosexual or am I drawn to the, the same gender? And, you know, you've been, you know, people live this out these days. Um, but uh, so, and so saying, do, do I want to be a lawyer seemed as, as daring as saying, you know, well, am I straight or am I gay? And um, yeah. because my father hated lawyers and I thought lawyers were, you know, the chain mail fist of the establishment. Uh, but, you know, when I peered into my own heart, the fact of the matter was I thought it was just incredibly interesting. So I really sucked up my courage and, uh, you know, took the LSAT and applied to law school and, uh, you know, and then ultimately turned down a very good academic job to, to go to law school. So mm -hmm. the, the hard part about making that decision wasn't just the, you know, the sort of cultural attachments to what it meant to be a lawyer. Um, I knew lawyers worked really hard, and that meant my lifelong ambition of being a novelist um, would, was in, in peril. But uh, I figured, well, you know, I, I don't, I'm not interested in having people tell me you can't do this. I was too young to have people tell me you can't do this. So I figured, okay, I'm, I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to be a lawyer, and I'm going to try to write. So I write a letter to my agent saying I'm going to law school, which since she'd been schlepping all over New York, one of my many unpublished novels, uh, that was uh, a hard letter to write. And I got in the middle of it and I thought, oh, this is really sounds pretty lame. You know, I'm going to be a writer anyway. Um, so I, I said um, that, you know, one of the things I've noticed is that nobody had written a really good nonfiction book about what it was like to be a law student day by day. Right. And carefully read, I wasn't really proposing that I would write that book. I was sort of offering this idea as a sop to her because, uh, you know, I, I was, I felt kind of letting her down. But uh, <laughs> she and I did not really communicate all that well. And she didn't read the letter very carefully and ended up showing it to an editor uh, who uh, thought this was a bang up idea and commissioned this book that I hadn't really proposed to write on the spot. So I ended up going to law school with a contract to write the book that became 1L. Uh, and um, I, you know, you, I cannot possibly describe the sense of, you know, I think it's John Adams who talks about savoring ironies. Um, and um, <laughs> or the, the education of Henry Adams. Well, anyway, um, that was a moment of just sabering irony. I stood on the step <laughs> of this apartment in San Francisco. Uh, walls could have been papered in rejection slips in that apartment. Uh, and here I am with a contract to write a book because I've decided to go to law school. And uh, the Great, the great reality of my life is that the great break of my literary career was deciding to go to law school. I got that book wow. contract, and more than that, I got a way to tap into subject matter that is just incredibly compelling to me, and that you know is always has in it the ferment that that's that's part of fiction. That brings us to a question from the audience. Um, that reads: Are you surprised about the continued interest in one L? among law students and those interested in going to law school? Well, uh, you know, any writer who finds that a book he or she has written is still in print 40 plus years later um, yeah. has, has, has been blessed. And given the changes uh, in legal education, uh, which 1L frankly called for, um, that have made it a less harsh environment, uh, you might find it surprising that the that the book still has as wide a readership as it does. 
But I think the piece of 1L um, that is, if not eternal, but certainly remains uh, true uh, today as much as it did four decades ago when I wrote the book, is that um, what I really was writing about was an identity struggle that uh, mm. really sharpened for law students because of the amount that you are called upon to jettison uh, in your past life. You know, your way, your sort of instinctive way of thinking about various uh, issues um, in how you deal with other people. Um, you know, your professors quickly convince you that those solutions are sentimental or not well-reasoned. And, um, and so everybody ends up with this experience as a law student, even today, that you're somehow being um, lured away from yourself. That you're taken away from who you thought you were when you came through the doors to the building. Um, and you're, you're picking up a new language um, and a new way uh, to think about things. Uh, the example in 1L um, is one of my classmates, and this was based on a conversation that I had with my dear friend, Jane Barron. Uh, and uh, Janie got uh, overwrought uh, out, outside of criminal law class, and she says, you know, I, I don't wanna think about uh, prostitution at a policy level. She says, she says, I know how I feel about prostitution. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, and it, it's complex because I think people should be free to do what they want with their own bodies. But on the other hand, I regard it as a terrible form of exploitation of, uh, of the people who live that life. Uh, and she said that that's how I feel about it. And that's what's important. And it's not going to change. And I don't care what the model uh, penal code says. Um, and uh, yeah. that is a... Uh, debate that people are forced to have with themselves in law school. And that's, that's still relevant to that. That leads us to another question from the audience. Do novels or writers as artists have a role in commentary on social issues? Well, um, Rid, you may know the answer to this. Um, <laughs> Cause I don't know whether it was Samuel Goldwyn or Daryl Zanuck. Ah who said to one of his ah. writers, if you want to send a message, use Western Union. Um, and you know, you know which of them said it? I, I, no, I but it sounds like Zanuck over, um, it, yeah. I always thought I don't it was think Zanuck, it, but somebody corrected me yeah. a few years ago, and I've never I been said it was Goldman? I well, said Goldman it was Goldman. Goldman is my all time, I mean, you know. To the glory of the internet, we'd be able to find out in about 20 yes. seconds, but I've chosen ignorance instead. <laughs> Um, but, um, I, you know, I think, I think we all experience in writing our books, as I said, a certain kind of ferment, which, which comes from the conflict that the story presents. And, you know, if there's a simple one word answer um, to uh, these, these dilemmas, these what, you know, to be grand, Faulkner referred to it as, human heart and conflict with itself. Um, if there was a one or two word answer, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need the novel. So, right. um, you know, I, I wrote a novel which was based in some part on my experiences as a lawyer in capital, uh, capital cases, people, cases where people have been sentenced to death. Uh, and I do have a fairly simple, um, you know, one word um, response to uh, to uh, capital punishment, which is I'm against it. But I regard it as an incredibly complex problem uh, mm -hmm. when you throw in the interests of victims uh, and their families uh, and the, the reality that even though most people won't murder again, there are some who will. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, in the emotional richness of the subject, um, because it's so extreme. The crimes are extreme uh, and the social answer to it is extreme. That, that's, that's much more complex than just a one word for or against. So uh, I don't 
think at its core, the novel is really about how do we change society? It might mm -hmm. be, the, 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 the big change, of course, is the one that comes from understanding what it's like to walk through the world in somebody else's shoes. And that's, that's mm -hmm. fundamental to our morality. Um, and uh, people who like reading fiction like that experience. Uh, and I think it deepens them as human beings uh, and, and makes them, you know, perhaps uh, people more capable of fulfilling the golden rule of doing unto others as they would have them be, be dealt with themselves. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't think the fundamental purpose of fiction is, is world change. Yeah, and law is such a rich environment for moral decision and moral courage. Um, no, no doubt about that. So, um, yeah. But what's uh, your in, is there an intention to a Scott Turo novel? Um, I always tell people I write to entertain. Um, I think of things like explore issues, discover character, engage the reader in a puzzle. Is there a particular way you look at your work from thirty thousand feet? Well, you know, Aristotle said the purpose of art is to enlighten and entertain. And um, that's rather right on. That, that, that about gets to it, you know. Um, <laughs> I don't think any of us will are happy writing um, unless we, um, uh, unless what we are writing about is of, is of inherent, um, and deep interest um, yeah. to us. Because let's face it, even if you think something is amusing uh, as an idea, uh, a year or two or three years later when you're still fooling around with it, um, it better be something that's deeply resonant to you as a person. Because otherwise you're gonna yep. word to tears uh, and feel like you know, your job finishing the, that book is pulling teeth. So yeah, you better be ready to live with this person for 12 months. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I knew like for when I started writing the last trial, I was fundamentally asking a question in the comparison between Sandy Stern and his client, how you measure the value of a life. Um, and you know, how, how, people outside and how we ourselves look at ourselves. Uh, and that's, well, that's obviously a, a, an interesting question, especially as you're getting older. So, uh, but that I seemed, well, that, that I thought I could live with. Um, and uh, some of the other harebrained ideas I've had, maybe not. So I'm gonna jump ahead here um, because you brought it up. Uh, the new the new novel, The Last Trial. Uh, you open it with rumination and contemplative retrospect and reflection of one who is singing his last song. Yeah. And please, God, tell me, Scott, you are not. This is not your last book. No, I, I, I'm. Yeah. I'm sure. I've been there's... worried about this since I got a copy of the book. I've been sweating this out. I'm sure there's a certain certain number of. Uh, people out there who pass through the bookstore and go, uh, if, they, if we ever get to the point where people can pass through the bookstore again, they go, the last <laughs> trial. Oh, thank God, the last. <laughs> we would have no more no. Trap, trap from him. Uh, no. But no, I'm not, I'm not holding my tent, although I don't think we're going to see Sandy Stern in, in court again after, right. after this book. Right. But uh, it, it's not my finale. It's, it's Sandy Stern's. It. It sort of, um, I mean, to me, it, the, the novel emphasizes family and it breathes the power and purpose of generational ties. Um, you know, was that something you knew going into it? Did you discover that as you got into it? Um, you know, where was that in your process? Well, because you lay it right out in the beginning, you know, here's yeah. this family, here's this, and it's, it's multi-generational right off the bat, which I just loved. It's a way you, to grab at your heart. You've written books that follow, um, you know, the same characters and parts of the same story. Sure. Um, and so, you, you know, you, you find yourself um, making yourself at home 
in a house that you know you, you've already built. Uh, so uh, 30 years ago, when I wrote The Burden of Proof, uh, you know, about Sandy Stern, Sandy Stern, for those people who are following the conversation, just to give them a reference point, Sandy Stern is uh, Rusty Savage's defense lawyer in Presumed Innocent. And it was played in the movie by Raul Julia. And, uh, you know, I, 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 after Presumed Innocent, I wrote a novel about Stern. And uh, one of the sort of resolutions to that book, which is carried through then in, in many of the Kendall County novels to follow, as Stern and his daughter Marta are referred to, is that they ended up becoming law partners. So, you know, to some extent, uh, I knew uh, that, yes, the, the emotional tie between a father and daughter who have uh, all kinds of strife uh, between the two of them as in every family, but who find um, a particular kind of consonance in being able to work together that was going to be a theme. And it's somewhere early, early on when I was just poking around the way I do at the start of the book, I... I came up with, uh, you know, I just in the way I think about things is I just write the scene, and so there was suddenly this scene where Marta Stern, who's been practicing law with her father for thirty years, comes in and announces to him that even though she's only in her late fifties, that she is retiring. Whatever the hell he wants to do, she is <laughs> retiring from the practice of law. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he's he's gobsmacked. Uh, uh, he just doesn't know how to react. He says all the wrong things. You know, like what have I been doing this for? Uh, and uh, so, and, and that you know, that's kind of a it 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 is a rather typical um, family issue, which is you know, he's saying, "What have I built this for?" And her short answer is, "For yourself, you." You know, you jerk. You haven't been doing this for me. What do you do? You think I? You're gonna kid either one of us about that? Um, but uh, and so they're working this out um, for the last time since it's not just Stern's last trial; it's Marta's. Uh, yeah. And then uh, <clears throat> Stern's eldest grandchild, uh, who uh, was a pregnancy in the burden of proof, has uh, showed up on the scene uh, as an eccentric. Uh, often difficult person uh, who uh, her aunt describes as somewhere on the spectrum. Uh, and she's working as their paralegal and sort of uh, a self-assigned role as criminal investigator. And, uh, and one, of the, one of the things I really like in the novel is that um, Sandy Stern and his eldest granddaughter have almost nothing in common. Um, you know, he, he, at one point he muses on the fact that he's given up trying to get her to read books, for example. She's, uh, she's just a completely different uh, person. And yet they have this incredibly deep bond uh, in which uh, they know each other and they trust each other. Uh, and, uh, you know, he, it's, he's, he's looking at her on an airplane in the, near the end of the book and just going, you know, if, I could live to be a million. I'm never going to understand love between human beings. <laughs> why it yeah. flourishes in some cases and why it doesn't in others. So, yeah, the family stuff was a lot of fun to write about. Because it touched base. You write, you write family and love so well, and you write it so often in your books, whether it's just a two-person romantic love or a, a generational kind of love like Ordinary Hero. Um, Ordinary Hero came out of a real life. Experience, yeah, that's yeah, based on yeah. you know, uh, it, it, it's a sort of sideways look at my father's war experiences. Since it is right. apropos something we talked about earlier, it's it's based on the experiences my father had and the experiences that he claimed he had had. Which, <laughs> of course, of reading the book, I found was pure fabrication. Um, uh, but what's the um. I mean, people have asked if uh, one of the questions we got from the audience was if you do you ever look back at um, a novel like Presumed Innocent or Burden of Proof or any of the number of extraordinary novels and say, oh, 
you know, I wish I had that back for 20 minutes and I could move this chapter. Or Do you have that kind of, uh, re you know, reflection on your own work? Um, yeah, all the time. I mean, first of all, I don't spend a lot of time rereading uh, unless I have to. Like I had to reread The Burden of Proof in order to write this book. I had to read. Oh, true. Yeah. I had to reread Innocence. You know, I made notes and um, extracted yeah. passages and, um, and you know, in the course of doing that, you, I'm sure you have exactly the same experience. You look at this and go, God, why was I such a knucklehead? I mean, there was a, just a much easier uh, or more compelling or, uh, you know, less incredible way to have done the same thing. And, uh, you know, but you don't, you don't get that book back. You wrote it. It's out there. Uh, and the answer, of course, is to do it right. Uh, do it right the next time. Uh, yeah, exactly. We'll live with the illusion that we will. So after copy edit, I, I've never read one of my books as a bound book until, like you, I had. The, I, right now, I've been asked by Disney to update my Kingdom Keeper series. That meant I had to read the books again. I've never read them in hardcover or paperback or anything. And I'm reading them and going, oh my gosh, how did they ever publish this thing? You know, right. There's so much I would take back and change. But you know, uh, you have the, you'll have the chance with the, with the updated book to- um, Yeah, that's it. I have now. We'll do it perfectly in, this time. Right? In one case, I, I rewrote the entire book. <laughs> I kept, of, of a 70,000 word book, I kept exactly 1,500 words. <laughs> and I, rewrote the whole rest of the book. Um, another question that was asked by our audience was, um, again, about presumed innocent and um, presumed innocent. Um, did you have any role in the development of the script? And subsequent to that, do you have any reflections on or experiences with Brian Dennehy since we recently lost him? Um, any comments about that? Well, I, I walked on the set of Presumed Innocent. I'd never been on a movie set before in my life. And um, I didn't realize this was unusual, but there was a particularly tense scene between uh, Harrison Ford and Raul Julia and Brian, who was uh, a, a tireless student of acting, wanted to watch this scene. So he was sitting on the set to watch uh, instead of doing what most actors do, which is taking advantage of the opportunity to relax back in their trailers. So, you know, I came in and, and Alan Pakula, the director, he too of blessed memory now, um, Alan uh, made this introduction in them between the two of us. Uh, and we very quickly got into this fairly intense conversation uh, in which Brian was explaining to me his view that uh, no movie based on a good novel was going to be anything uh, better than like a Reader's Digest abridgment of a novel. Because oh my so much, gosh. So much has to be left out. And uh, we, were, we just became, uh, each of us, quite involved in this conversation. And to the point that Pakula suddenly yells, cut! And he turns around, well, the, and Alan's a very mild person, because, well, the two of you, shut up! And <laughs> because we had become a distraction to everybody else working on the set. You're, you're sword fighting over there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we got up and went, went behind the set, but continued the conversation, and the conversation continued uh, for 30 years. And uh, wow. Brian was a really a dear friend. Uh, I had a long talk last week with his widow, uh, Jennifer. And uh, he was a giant in yeah. every way. Not only, I mean, I've never seen a human being with a rib cage like that. Yeah, uh, exactly. But, uh, but beyond that, um, just yeah. a powerful mind, people, uh, Few people who saw him on the screen realized um, that I've heard many directors describe him as the most intelligent actor they ever worked with, uh, which, by the way, is sometimes regarded as a disability. 
you can reflect too much on what mm. you're doing instead of being an instinctive. But uh, I thought a huge amount about the theater and about acting and about the meaning of the scripts that he was, and he read just constantly. Uh, and I got more great book recommendations from Brian than virtually anybody I know. And, uh, mm. you know, so you, you get to an age and people begin to, you know, slide out of the scene. Um, but I right. will miss Brian. Uh, we had several great, great um, evenings and, you know, days together. And, uh, and I, the one thing I knew whenever I saw him was, you know, we were going to be talking constantly and it was going to be an amazing conversation, at least for me. I always wanted to see Brian Dennehy play my character, Lou Bolt. That was yeah. my big dream in life. First, it was Gene Hackman. And then Gene Hackman got a little old. And then Brian Dennehy never got old. Yeah. He was just unbelievable. I mean, he, he might look a little different, but man, he had that power of an actor. One of the, you know. one of the more amazing things about Brian, um, I remember it's now several years ago, but he was doing Desire Out Under the Elms in Chicago. And he strode across the stage, um, you know, as this powerful figure. Once you got backstage and the adrenaline was gone, he could, his knees were always horrible. And in point of fact, um, were what ultimately undermined his health. He developed, he was so accustomed to huh. being in pain that he didn't know that he had an infection in one of his knees. Um, oh my God. But he could barely move once he was off the stage. He was an old football player at Columbia. Uh, and, uh, you know, like a lot of old football players, he had wrecked his body in a way that couldn't really be fixed. Going back to Last Trial, what was the most challenging character to write and why? <laughs> uh, probably the client, Carol Pafko, who's. Pafko who's supposed to be a great man of science, uh, at least so he presents himself as being, Nobel Prize winner in medicine. Um, but uh, to say the least, a man with some flaws and some obvious vices. And uh, I always want readers to understand the world from the perspective of the so-called bad guy because yes. uh, they 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 always have a point of view and uh we can look at them and say uh no i, I don't really think of donald trump as a victim but that is how he sees himself uh right. you know that is what he broadcasts constantly about himself i'm a victim all these people are so unfair to me i'm so misunderstood um, and, uh, so even if you don't accept that narrative, uh, the character's narrative about, you know, him or herself, um, then uh, you, you should at least offer the reader the opportunity to understand this person, uh, as, as more than a manifestation of pure evil. So, yeah. And even if you don't get to sympathy, at least that keeps you away from cardboard characters. Yeah, um, which which I so admire about your books is everybody has depth, uh, and that's you know to me that's true fiction. You know, as people ask me about you, and I say, you know, he doesn't write legal thrillers; he writes great fiction, and they happen to be centered around the practice of law. Well, that's nice, of um, but you know, but, but that really is the way you roll. Um, with Carol, for example. Um, what really deepened the character for me was the fact that uh, he, along the way he had been Stern's doctor. And um, for everything that it turns out in the novel that Carol has done wrong, uh, and as Stern acknowledges about his longtime practice, you don't generally end up uh, as the defendant accused of several federal felonies. Uh, having right. acted completely blamelessly throughout your life. Um, for all of that, he had tremendous gifts as a treating physician. 
uh, which Stern was lucky enough to experience from his friend. Uh, and his deepest debt to PAFCO, and one of the reasons he agrees to represent him is because he has this debt to PAFCO in his role as a professional. Uh, you know, not because he's a great rock on tour or, you know, because his family owns a vineyard in Argentina and he brings great wine to lunch. Uh, <laughs> but because, uh, you know, as a doctor, he really gave stern hope about his own sickness. Yeah. Did you have a, um, did you have a moment in the last trial or, or can you now look back on it and, and think of that and um, think, you know, that was the most fun chapter to write or that was the most fun character to write? Um, well, you know, there are those special there, moments when we're writing along and you go, oh, oh yeah, I'm here at the right time, you know. So, sometimes other lawyers will say to me, wow, you know, those cross examinations in your books, they're really they're really great. And I always point out to them that cross is a whole lot easier when you not only get to uh, write the questions, but also the answers. Uh, but there are, uh, there are a couple of um, cross examinations at the climax of the book uh, that, were, um, that were a lot of fun. I, I'm, I'm sure you have the same experience. As a matter of fact, knowing how you work, I know you have to have had this experience where you've got a scene coming up uh, and you almost have to hold yourself back uh, because it's a treat that you're going to give yourself because there's a, a lot of struggling before you get to the point, that point. But, you know, boy, when, you know, when that, when that woman, that Wall Street Journal reporter walks in the courtroom, I am going to have one hell of a lot of fun. <laughs> Do you, um, we, we talked years ago about how, how you work. We work so differently, but, okay, and, and, and maybe you can yeah. share that a little bit, but it, it almost surprises me there to hear you say that you can, you can look forward to a, a chapter as a character in that um, it's my understanding that after you spend months and months, sometimes years, writing down sort of ideas and ideas for scenes that you'll write any scene that suits you at that moment. Yeah. And I then did. at some point stitch them together. So how does that, how did that work in the last trial? How well, much of that was outlined or whatever? A a apropos of exactly what we're talking about. And you really need to take a minute because I think one of the most interesting things that people find in listening to authors talk is, their descriptions of how they work. Um, but if I'm talking about those cross examinations, for example, uh, in my year of rumination about the book, uh, I had written parts of those scenes. So I knew what was huh. there, but um, I didn't know how it was all going to fall together. And once I get to a certain point where I have sort of like the highlight reel, uh, as it were, then I have to figure out how how to how to connect it. So, and that's in enormous distinction from the way that that you work. And you really, Britt, ought to take a minute to just describe that for the listeners and readers who are out there. Well, I'm just more of a, you know, I, I put the big scenes on the wall and then sort of fill and and find my way through you know I, I compare it to when when our kids were little i would push a the cover of a straw down you know in a restaurant and then pull the straw out and put a drop of water on it and it would accordion out and that's that's kind of how i write in my outline phase but you that's right you have an outline phase right very strict outline and that's why i was just on my tongue I, I hope it didn't fall out while i was listening but basically you were saying you had written pieces of the very end of the novel very early on. Yeah. And did you know it? Did you know it was the end of the novel? Uh, you know, it depends at what phase you're at. Um, or in my case, um, you know, there's a scene at the end of the Burden of Proof where um, Stern is hauling around a dead body. Now, I knew from the yeah. time I started 
working on that book, that that scene was going to be uh, at the climax. Uh, most of the time though, that, that, that is not the case. Now it may be some point in that year that we're talking about uh, of, of just making notes and taking ideas and getting ideas for scenes. Um, at some point there, I will, um, I, I may come up with the ending, but usually, certainly not when I'm first writing, describing the character and, you know, writing the openings. And um, so, and I, you know, what's always struck me about the way you work, Rid, is that, um, I don't, I don't think you feel like you can go forward without an outline. And, um, and it's so different from novelist to novelist. You know, I remember Sue Grafton, um, may she rest in peace, saying that she couldn't write chapter two until chapter one was word perfect, as far as she yeah. was concerned. Uh, and, uh, you know, every, everybody does it his or her own way, and yet, um, you know, there's a, when it works, there's that similarity that, you know, there's this incredibly gripping, compelling, imagined world. Um, so Harlan Coben, um, who's a buddy of both of ours, um, he, he sort of lies on a couch for several weeks and looks for, you know, two or three just phenomenal twists, hmm. uh, I, I believe, and then sort of builds his book out from those. You have amazing twists in your novels. Um, and are those, where, where do those fall in your process? Because one would think you've, you've latched onto those fairly early in order to turn that twist correctly, or do you in fact just stumble into them? It's, um, no, I, 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 unfortunately I stumble. Uh, you do uh, really. And, and yet you follow those things. compelling. I mean, this, but I mean, I can remember like, uh, the book that I am working on now. Um, uh, I, I have thought of what I regard as the big twist. And I, I was really proud of myself, uh, when, uh, when I did it. But now I have to figure out how to make it as un, um, unpredictable to the reader as it was to right. me as the, as the writer. Um, but like, you know, with Presumed Innocent, I had written, worked on that book for a couple of years in my spare moments. I had no damn idea who the killer was. Uh, wow! And, um, you know, I was oh, writing a morning commuter train and I got to this one moment where it turns out that Raymond Horgan, the prosecuting attorney, the, the big boss, has uh, in his own desk drawer an important file that had been in the murder victim's um, you know, it was supposed to have been in the murder victim's office. Uh, so he reaches into this desk drawer, desk, desk drawer and hands the file to Rusty, who's investigating this case. And I'm going like, I'm sitting on the morning commuter train. I write it out and I go like, what the hell is that about? How did that file get there? What, what in the world? Um, and the fact that Raymond had a personal relationship with the, with, with Carolyn, the, the murder victim, was born in that. Uh, but I had no idea at that point uh, until that I had to amazing. explain why he had that file. That is just amazing to me. Do you um, consider your audience ever before you write? Who are you writing for? And, you know, if, if you're telling a class, are you writing for an audience? Or are you writing for yourself? Who are you writing for? Um, I, you know, as a young person and have always spent a lot of time thinking about this. And I, you know, I've known painters who will say, oh, I just, I just do this for myself. Uh, and that frankly is, I think, bullshit. I think every artist wants um, the praise of the audience. They want the audience to say, you have summoned up something essential in human experience uh, mm. that I hadn't quite recognized before you did that, but now you've enlightened me. Uh, and so the audience is, is part of it. Um, 
sometimes a highly idealized audience. Uh, and yet, um, I really have very, very little use for art of all kinds um, that is written with um, indifference to whether it'll be understood um, you know, by the audience. Uh, and I, you know, I go back to Tolstoy who said that, um, you know, the idea that, that, that great art can't be understood by most people is the same thing as saying that, you know, great food uh, doesn't taste good to most people. It's, it's not great food and it's not great art. <laughs> um, what editors have, or which editors have you worked with and, and how, how much do they help you shape your work? Uh, well, I've had four editors. Um, okay. Uh, the first was Ned Chase, who was the editor on 1L. And, uh, you know, I was a very young writer and Ned was a senior editor. And um, one of the reasons that I am as close as I am to my agent, Gail Hockman, is because she was, she was Ned's assistant at that point. Uh, and Whoa. Ned would say certain things to me which were incomprehensible to me. And so I'd call Gail and I'd say, well, what did he mean by this? And uh, she would basically say, well, nobody ever really quite knows what he means, but if you want my <laughs> guess, I think this is what he meant. So the reality, frankly, is that Gail was more the editor than Ned was because I was yeah. relying on her interpretations of Ned. Um, then I had um, a long-term relationship with my beloved friend, John Galassi, uh, who mm. uh, has just given up the reins as you know, publisher at Ferris, Strauss, and Giroux. Uh, and, you know, we became and remain dear friends in the yeah. process. And, uh, you know, Jonathan, probably more than anybody else, uh, wanted to play in my sandbox. He really wanted to understand the creative process uh, and to offer what he could. Uh, and he's a unique, uniquely talented human being. But we would sit in a hotel room and turn every page of the manuscript and he would, he would just free associate either, you know, as little as a word or, you know, what are the biggest ideas that are represented here. Then, uh, Eventually, I had a paperback and a hardcover publisher, and I was informed by both of them that, that that just didn't work in the contemporary scene. So I had to go but choose one of the, my two publishers and ended up going with a, the former paperback publisher, which is Warner Books, uh, and uh, now Grant Central. And Deb Futter became my editor. Um, yeah. We had a great relationship. Uh, and Deb, Deb was very good at, um, you know, sort of fixating on what she thought were the major issues in a book and then being like a goddamn terrier uh, until I had uh, addressed those issues. Uh, this book was ed edited by Ben Severe, who basically, you know, took, took Deb's job uh, at Grand Central as the editor in chief there. And, uh, and Ben is somewhere in between. He's got more of a wide perspective. He'll ask particular questions about particular scenes. Um, but in like Jonathan, um, he was not afraid to venture creative solutions of his own. So that huh. the, the prologue in the last trial uh, was Ben's idea. Um, we huh. got through about three or four drafts and he said, you know, you've got this moment near the end of the book. Uh, and if you really think about it, because the whole book's from Sandy's point of view, it's, it's under dramatized. We don't see it happening from outside. Um, so uh, why don't we see it from outside to start the book? Uh, and it was a brilliant idea. I thought he was crazy at first. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I was able to write it in like an hour. Uh, and when it comes that easily, you know that there's something in it. Um, and, uh, I, you know, it turns out that he was completely correct. 
So, yeah. so Rid, tell us, we have just a couple seconds left. Tell us what you're working on. Oh, I'm involved in, in a lot of things. I'm still writing a bunch for Disney and uh, I'm writing graphic novels for um, very young kids uh, for, for DC Entertainment, DC Comics called Super Sons. And I have a second series called The Indestructibles. Uh, and those are all done in script form. And, uh, you know, I love writing scripts. So it's been a really comfortable, comfortable area for me. But let me, let me take us out. Thank you, first of all, for, for giving us this time um, and to LA Talks for all they're doing. But um, if, uh, which character of yours in, in over the course of your career lives the loudest inside you? Mm -hmm. See, that's a question only another, um, only Yeah, maybe that's too wonky. Because he doesn't say who's your favorite character. Like, you know. No, no. Who's your favorite child? It's like, whose voice do you hear? Um, yeah. Who's loud? Um, Who haunts you? You know, and there are, there, for me, there are three characters. And there's no question Sandy Stern is the first of them. Because um, yeah. he embodies so much of... Um, you know, of, of my experience of the law as I've lived it and practiced it. Um, you know, and then there's Rusty Savage, um, who uh, is certainly a man of, uh, uh, who's a, a little bit self-deceived, and I love that about him. Um, <laughs> and, um, and then Sonny Klonsky, who is the, the judge in The Last Trial, and I've only really written from her point of view once, but in many ways, I thought her sensibility was the closest to my own in terms of just the way oh. she sees the world as a whole, not just the law, but every, all parts of her life. So, Wow, that's interesting. There's a multiple. Yeah, it's, I, I, I have a couple female characters that feel the closest to me, too. I, I'm not sure why that is, but uh, I think that's they? that rolls. Well, thank you. Uh, Thank you for spending the time with us and, and sharing. We know the last trial will be a huge success. And uh, are there film interest in it yet? Have you, you, know, have uh, you gone that direction? Um, first of all, 85-year-old uh, men are not exactly the demographic that Hollywood is but looking. there are a lot of actors out there now. There are a lot of elderly actors. Um, we'll see what happens. There's certainly a very active discussion right at the moment. Um, exactly. so, but you know, you and I, and in many ways you have more experience in Hollywood than I do, but, um, you know, many a slip between cup and lip as Shakespeare put it. So <laughs> we'll see what, we'll well, see what inspires. So thank you so much. We'll, we'll, we'll look forward to reading it. Thank you for spending the time with us. Oh, Thanks thank to you. both of you. Uh, terrific conversation. To learn more about uh, Ridley's work, visit RidleyPearson.com and Scott at scottturo.com. Uh, Scott's new book again is The Last Trial and it is available wherever books are sold. Thank you again. Thanks, Thanks. Ted. Thank you.